thing. I would like to welcome the stage from Reanimator. Uh, oh, let me make sure I get it right. Okay, Jeffrey Combs. <laughs> I mean, I think it lucked out partially because it was before CGI, because in the early days of CGI, you look at those movies, you go, ooh, ah, right. kind of dates it. You see the edges. Oh, not good. So this one is all practical, and so it's far more forgiving, and the fantasy tone and quality is uh, sustained. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, age very much, so it retains its kind of world. You can't fall in love just with tone. So, like, this is, this, we're talking about like people are falling in love over time to keep coming back to something. So, what is it that I mean? I have to assume it's something in the characters. I think it's character plot. Yeah. I mean, it fairly flies. It's fast paced, uh, and, and it's dealing with big things yeah. and dealing with it in a very clever way. Uh, um, Characters have things are at stake. Uh, even though there's laughs, we do play it sincerely. I think, don't, don't. So I, um, you know, it's it's just has a a honesty about it, even though it's outrageous. And uh, everybody wants to not die. <laughs> uh, speaking of, of outrageous, well, one of the men who couldn't be here today is obviously Stuart Gordon. Oh boy, yes. And I mean. You know, if you actually do some research on him, I think most horror fans just go, oh, he made Reanimator first, and that's how we get to know this guy. But if you look for that, this is a guy doing really outrageous theater for a very long time, really provocative. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, like, he asks for nudity in his films, but he's also happy to be nude himself on stage, right? So it's like, to me, that's putting your money where your mouth is. I did not know that. <laughs> uh, but I was curious, what is all of your first impressions of Stuart when you first met him? Uh, obviously, I don't know if, it's, if he was even around for Bride Reanimator, Kathleen, but uh, we could use you, you, you as a proxy, even though they're very different guys. I don't recall him being around. Okay. Not at all. So what were your first impressions? How'd you meet? I don't remember who was there. What? <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, uh, Stuart is um, a larger-than-life character. Very funny, very dark sense of humor, obviously. Um, you know, he's a very demanding director. Uh, he, it, I often say if he could play every part in the film, he would. Um, because he has very definite ideas about how he wants you to play your character. He's very collaborative, but he has definite ideas. And um, he's big, right? So he came from the theater, and uh, I, you know, 
the energy through which things flow is uh, emotions flow through a character is is really the same whether you're doing stage or television or film. Um, but the aperture through which that flows is sometimes smaller or bigger, um, depending on what you're doing. And for stage, it's a little bit bigger, and for film, it's smaller. But for Stewart, it wasn't smaller. So he wanted everything very big and very large. And I think uh, that makes his movies have a certain quality and a tone to them that feel kind of operatic. And Mick Garris has talked about this before, about, it, about Seward's movies being kind of operatic, and I think that's true. Um, they have a lot of energy. And he, as a person, had a lot of energy, had a lot of creative ideas. I just feel like, you know, when I met him, he was sort of a mini genius, really. Yeah, what about you? Um, I thought Stuart was just a really big teddy bear at first. You know, <laughs> I could love blood. He just, it was, I think he called him Stuart and Old Blood Gordon for quite a while. And, um, but he was always really kind, really soft spoken. He wasn't a, a harsh guy at all. He was just really, really sweet. And um, he was a great communicator, but also, like Barbara said, a really good collaborator. He, um, he had, his, his style is very muscular because he came from the theater. So he wanted really active choices, and he was also so smart uh, to, you know, you've heard this before, but he rehearsed, you know, we rehearsed for like, like before. Which, I think it was three weeks, and it was in my living room. Remember, it was my living room. Because I had the biggest living room for some reason, so we all went to my house. That's right. I that. Um, so that was a really great idea because a lot of this thing, there's a lot of musicality to this, and he saw that. He's also, he's really, you know, uh, uh, a great orchestra kind of person, and he saw a certain muscularity and a certain music to it, and it took us a little bit of time to find it, but um, pace was a really important thing, and he knew all about that from the theater, and um, so he, 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 can, he can, you know, Thank, thank, thanks to him, you know, he, he cast really well, and he didn't really care who he was casting. He just wanted the right person for the role, and that took a certain amount of guts, you know, to start. That was my first time. Um, I was doing a play, small theater in L.A. Cast director said, you know, you might be right for something of casting. It was like, you know, as a actor, just like good. Oh God, okay. So. Um, Got the call, maybe a week later, went in and met this very gentle, quiet, soft-spoken, long-haired, bushy, bearded dude who's like, this is based on H.P. Lovecraft. And, well, I'm, 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 I'm sorry to tell you, I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know who, who that was. Without realizing it, however, I did know. H.P. Lovecraft was because I used to read Erie Magazine and of course you read horror stories and short stories when you're younger and so Lovecraft sold over that. Whether it was him or it was someone who was influenced by him, I'd already been inculcated with, with Lovecraft. But Stewart was uh, very gentle, very calm. Um, I read for him and the next thing I know I got a call for a callback. Mm. And, um, uh, the rest is like, you know, that's horror cinema history, you uh, cast me. Um, and we did rehearse. I think that's the key element to our success. When we showed up, we shot Reanimator in 18 days. 18 days. But every scene we went, oh yeah, okay, we know what we're doing and you're going to do that. There's none of this, uh, usually on a set it's like, what are we going to do with this? And where am I moving? And when do I move? We, we had so the 18 days was really, uh, we already had money in the bank. We, we did get a lot out of that 18 days, but if you recall, he also wouldn't stop filming. So yeah. at the end of whatever it was, 11 or 12 hour day, we kept going. And, right? Yeah. And on many days, we spent 14, 15 hours on the set. And I, I think our last day was something like 16 or 18 days because it was, uh, 16 or 18 hours because it was right before Christmas and I my check for overtime was more than the money I actually made on the film <laughs> <laughs> because 
because right. Stuart, you know, it was like the end of the day, Stuart would say, well, you know, I'm not done, I want this, I want that. So even though we, you know, we did know where we were gonna move and he There's always, had to plot it out, there was, he just wouldn't stop, he wanted more material. I think part of that was that it was the first movie that Stuart had ever directed. Not the first time he directed, but the first time he ever directed a film, and so, it, 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 it's a little harder to let go and go, I think we got that on take three, and if not, you know, take four was good. You know, so sometimes he would, uh, he, he, he would overshoot just simply because, you know, he wanted to be sure, sure, or maybe get it one, as opposed to know that, well, that worked in that take, and that worked in that, I have to cut, so. Yeah. Good luck, I it's, I mean, it strikes me as a great lesson for indie filmmakers right now, this idea that if you only have 18 or 12 days, you better get some rehearsal time. Get the rehearsal in, because yeah. problems are solved before you get on set and uh, you go, oh my god, I don't know when I move. But sometimes you get actors that don't know uh, how to sort of motivate their own choices. You, you know, get that out of the way. My, I mean, my feeling to that, towards the first question I asked, which is why this one lasts, I think chemistry. I think there's yes. just incredible chemistry. You don't just stand back and go, oh, it's that one role. It's the chemistry between these people on screen. I was so lucky to have this cast. I mean, to have to have Bruce right there, we, we, we clicked right away. I mean, we have so many scenes together. It was like, I am so lucky. I think most actors, if they're available to their the people they're with, you know, you sort of know who you are, and then it drops away, and then everything's in your partner's eyes. Everything comes from them. Yeah, I often think with chemistry that sometimes you're not really watching an individual performance, but you're watching the energy that's passed between those that's two right. people. That's right. So that's what you're really seeing on screen, and you have to be open, and you have to be available. And even though I feel like I had great chemistry with both these guys, and I really like them, um, I think if you're open and available, you can have chemistry with anyone. You just have to tell the truth about what's going on between you. I mean, I've worked with people before that maybe I didn't like as much, but you have to just use whatever that is and tell the truth about that in the moment. And something will happen. There'll be something between you. And it, 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 it. This thought, uh, movies are, are shot or edited the way Reanimator is. Uh, in other words, there are a lot of two shots where it's a, it, it's a tennis match. You, you're, you're, you're watching what's going on and I feel that a lot of films these days and a lot of directors, uh, well, and maybe it's actors can't sustain a longer through line, but they will cut and they'll cut to the close-up and cut to the close-up and then back to that close-up and then wide, then back to that close-up and then over there. And it's, it's, it's a manufactured pace as opposed to an organic, true pace that the actors have found the music, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it frustrates me when I see movies and I see a lot of, uh, I, I think, okay, well, this is technical, but it's not, it's not. Yeah, the industry's sort of fallen in love with the close-up, and they've sort of abandoned the master. You know, and in the master, if you don't go back too far, you know, you can see everything, and it's hard to trust as a filmmaker because you can get in there, you get closer, right? So you see a little bit more, but you lose the architecture of the thing, right. and that it's so strong when it works, and you really let it let it fly and there's such a repartee. And I think sometimes rhythm. they have to because the actors aren't uh, aren't knowledgeable enough to repeat their 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 actions. And so they go, oh shit, we can't go away and come back because now he's here instead of here. Uh, I've been on sets now where it's like, where's the continuity person? Oh we don't have one. It's like, really? Well, nice right. choice. Because uh, you're going to just buy problems. Yeah, because you're in the in the wide shot for those. You're actually seeing both actors in the same time. So you're seeing the chemistry. It's not a that's right. It's not a manufactured <laughs> pace. It's a manufactured because we got to move this along. We're doing it, and that's kind of like practical effects versus CG. You know, the CG is the is in a sense the close up where the other actor wasn't there to be your opposite. Well, and do you know how hard it is as an actor to play something that's not there? To, to react to it, it's so difficult. Uh, 
obviously David Gale is another person who wow. can't be here, but is part of this key chemistry between the four of you. Uh, you know, speak to me a little bit about uh, memories of being on set with him, because he's obviously, it's a wild character, obviously, Doug Gentleman, he's a gentleman, a sweet, gentle guy, uh, a professional stage actor from New York had come out not too long before Reanimator came along to pursue films and television. And uh, we just immediately liked him. My callback was uh, doing this defacement scene with David Gale, and we both got the part. Uh, not the same part, but. <laughs> and so I, I was thrilled about that because uh, it's just a man of stature and uh, an authority and just, again, totally, exactly right, arch enough and villainous enough and charismatic and, uh, and very skilled as an actor. And uh, we all just adored him. He was a, he was a, a sweet guy and uh, I felt sorry for him being stuck uh, mostly under a tape a lot of the time <laughs> uh, with his head of a false bottom of a little pan. But it, I mean, you guys have the benefit, I think, by a film being cast as an orchestration because so often it'll be like, oh, here's the good guy, here's the bad guy, and here's the girlfriend. And in this, it's like, you could be considered the bad guy, well, but then here comes Dr. Dill. Maybe I'm the red herring a little bit. Yeah. I was like, I'm the catalyst that's creating all this chaos, but guess what? There's someone even worse. <laughs> and, and everyone gets an arc. I mean, your arc is actually, you know, the perfect movie arc. You know, you start as somebody who's really wanting to bring somebody back to life, you're hitting and beating their chest, and by, by the end, you're full of moral, of, of a real moral center, and by the end, He's rubbed off on you. I've destroyed him. And true love, you're willing to bring him back. I don't know about rubbed off. He <laughs> <laughs> was a good guy, a bad guy, and a really stupid guy. Yeah. <laughs> but what about you guys with Dr. Dr. Hill? What, was, what were some of your memories? Obviously, Barbara, you had like the most, I mean, you're, it's ref, you're referenced in American Beauty. I mean, that is, to me, when I saw that as a horror fan, I was just like, oh my god, they're talking about reality. Visually referenced as well. Yeah. Because at the end, when she's lying there, and the head looms in, and the upper left frame, and it's, hey, that's, that's, that's right out of the end. It's so, it's, it's so, I mean, just in terms of pop culture. So clearly, uh, these scenes are like pushing the limits. I think that's the other thing. He pushes all his boundaries as far as he can go. The black humor as far as it can go. But what was your memory of working with the Um, You know, exactly what Jeffrey said. I, I felt that he was very kind to me and um, very, you know, open and nice and, you know, obviously it was a delicate scene that I had to perform with him and, um, you know, people often ask me, was that a more difficult scene to shoot than any other? And really I say no, it, it wasn't. I mean, it, it definitely was a scene that pushed the boundaries, but it was in keeping with, you know, the, the bigness and the over-the-topness of the whole film and I mean, you just have to play that stuff completely straight as if it's happening. It's just part of the story. So, you know, a little bit it was nerve-wracking for me, but I didn't find it harder to shoot than any other scene. And with somebody like David, who was a complete professional, um, it was it was actually a fun scene to shoot. I mean, we had a good time. I mean, if you think about it thematically, uh, Reanimator is a, a heightened, amped up melodrama. Mm -hmm. You've got Snidely with Flash, and you've got Belle, the damsel in distress, tied. Dudley do right. And you're Dudley do right, and tied to the railroad tracks. And at the last minute, you know, she's she's saved by, well, sort of a good guy. But you, you, you see what I mean there? It, it is a thematic thing that it's not a new uh, dynamic. Yeah. It's just a more clever, uh, horrified, mm -hmm. uh, amped up version of it. Yeah. I remember trying to take a nap during that scene <laughs> upstairs. <laughs> yeah, that and wasn't possible. Barbara has this beautiful voice anyway, she's a world class screamer, right? Yeah. So every time you see it, well, our dressing rooms were next to each other. We go like, do you hear that? <laughs> they're like playing her right now. So check that. I also remember that scene to be extremely choreographed, though. There was like, okay, what are the beats? You know, you wake up and where disorientation, and then realization, and then horrification, and then 
pleading, and then, you know, it, it, there was very specific beats that Stuart and I talked about that he wanted to get for each moment, so right. it all built on So it wasn't money, it was very specific in its build, yeah. Which is what you guys are looking for, right? Specific direction. I, I like specific direction. I actually really like heavy direction. I like collaboration. I like to talk with the other actors and really psychologically get in there. I like to talk to my director and say, you know, I want to be in your movie. What What do you want from me? What are, what are we doing here? I know there's a lot of actors that don't like to be talked to at all. They just want to be kind of left alone, but I don't want to be left alone. I, I want to get it right in there. What was that? Obviously, the pace of production was really intense. I, I saw when Joe Ball breaks kind of played reanimator recently, and he was giving little factoids. The one that blew me away was the part that had no exteriors. And I mean, that's just one of those things when you watch a movie, you're not really, I wasn't conscious of it. Yeah, there are, there are establishing shots of like the house that that Dan lived in yeah. and I rented a room in. But no scenes of you guys walking but, around that but, but no scenes of us walking yeah. on the streets. There's an establishing shot of a medical building. The, that's it. Right, so it's all, all insular. Interiors. So it's you guys are, which just kind of feels like a stage, but with that pace of production and then throwing in heavy effects, and most of you are having this background in theater, how big a how big a leap and a change was that to you in terms of working that fast with something that takes so long? Well, you know, they, they were kind of prepared, and it didn't really always take all that long because kind of, if we were rehearsed, I think they were sort of prepped as well. A lot of blood. I mean, that's the thing. What you see for 10 seconds <laughs> in a shot, we're looking at it for half a day or a day, you know? And it's kind of like, oh, you know, you forget, well, this is just for a little bit. It, it, but, but for us, we're just, we're just visually and sensorily just hammered with it all the time. And, and that kind of, kind of gets to you after a while. You go, my God, what are we shooting? I, I worked on a lot of soap operas as well. There's nothing blood, faster than a soap opera. <laughs> when you're doing 80 pages a day, I'm not doing 80 pages a day, but I had times when I was doing 40, and you just have That's to know yourself. I didn't know it was crazy. You just, it's memorization. But anyway, we're talking about Rihanna there. I, yeah, I think because of the rehearsal, I think that that really helped us. But I do know that today, because you know uh, margins are slimmer and profits are shrinking, that um, everybody wants to make a movie in 15 or you know 17 days, and so you do have to hurry up. Um, and I think sometimes that can compromise the material a little bit. And I do think, because I still continue to work in a lot of these independent, low-budget movies where you don't know what's going to happen with them. You take them to film festivals, and you hope that somebody's going to buy it. Um, that uh, people don't rehearse enough. So let's go back to that for a minute. I think you, yep. you know, I'll do rehearsal for free. Um, if somebody casts me in a movie, if you want me to show up, just pay my hotel room for a week, and I'll just rehearse the whole time, you know, for a week beforehand. I think that's key, and I think enough. A lot of filmmakers don't don't do that. Well, there's reasons for that. One, uh, uh, if our union gets wind of that. They do not like it because, hey, wait a minute, they're working, right? Rehearsal is working. And so it's been that way in Hollywood forever. You don't know, pay actors for rehearsal. You just, they show up and you cobble something together on the day and just figure it out. You're professionals, right? But, you know, theater's got to figure it out. You've got to work up its process before you can go, okay, we can open. Right? I mean, we're all rehearsing at home, so we're rehearsing our lines, we're imagining... But by ourselves. You know, by ourselves, but... Yeah. And if actors are lucky enough to know each other, they'll call each other, hey, you want to work that scene? But yes. we didn't know each other, particularly, and it really helped. It was really a key element. Besides the budget, so we're talking about this kind of 34-year span, and you've all continued working in this period. In that time, what is the biggest, what do you maybe miss most about that period of 80s filmmaking compared to now? I mean, the budgets are obvious in digital, the shift to digital, and those two things are obviously very tried, but are there other key things about this industry that have radically shifted uh, that you maybe miss what was happening in the 80s? I don't know if people miss the 80s. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, for the fan, it's probably, you know, the practical effects. Whenever I know from social media, whenever anybody's going to be making a movie, they say, it's all going to be practical. Everybody's all excited about that. So I think that's one thing. But I, I mean, I find it exciting to work today. 
too. Um, you know, I don't, I don't wax romantic for the 80s because I think people are doing some really cool stuff right now. Um, and I think you, it's, anybody can make a movie now. You can make a movie on your iPhone. And I, you know, when we were making movies in the 80s, um, you had to go to a film festival. You, you couldn't go to a film festival because a lot of them didn't exist. They had the bigger ones, but distribution was already built in. You know, now you, you have to take your independent movie to a film festival and maybe go on the circuit. So I've been doing that for a few years. And I, I've been able to meet a lot of fans and see different places in the world and see films from so many other countries that I maybe wouldn't have seen before. And I feel like our community, because of social media, is a little bit more um, known to one another. And I really like that. Like, I feel like I'm part of a group that I didn't know I belonged to maybe 30 years ago. You know, Let's be honest, Barbara cheats because a little unknown thing is I remember going to the screening of one of your premieres and you had made cookies for everyone in the entire audience at Beyond the Gates. And I'm just like, this is cheating. How would you not get recast on everything? <laughs> well, yeah, it was Beyond the Gates and it played at um, the LA Film Festival. And I was also one of the producers on that movie and I thought, how can I make these people love the movie I more. I I'm going to give some sugar. Hey, man, well, what's, yeah. what else is in the cookies? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to do. Um, Any big changes? Uh, yeah, uh, the first thing that thought uh, jumped into my head is uh, I miss film. I miss film. I miss the look of film. Uh, uh, I, I love that now there's a depth and a quality of film that is almost um, inarticulated, but there's just a richness to it. Everything is so kind of crisp and edgy now, and I don't, I don't get the depth. I miss that. And I, I, I've talked to student filmmakers a lot about this, but sometimes there's also a missing tension. Things because there's only so much film. That's my yeah. yeah. That's that's the other thing is that a lot of the time film was expensive and so you had a finite length of film and there were so many times where it was like we have to get this and so it's almost like game time. Yeah. Right now it's like okay uh, we're going to uh, we're going to do the scene and uh, when you're done. Uh, just come around and, and, and do it again. Just and which is great because I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, it's like eh, you know if I don't get it in this thing, then you know I'm going to be turning around and doing it again. Be, you know, it's, it's kind of a give and a take there. That that's um, there's there's kind of a an intensity of like this is it, this is it. But I do not miss. Like a lot of the time, on a little bunch of toys, like they'd be like, they would be using uh, uh, ends. What, what do they call them? Uh, short ends. Where other productions would, uh, they, you know, that had a lot of money, they they would develop their film, but they wouldn't go all the way to the end of the reel. So there would be these portions of film that that other like smaller companies could like buy really cheap and use because they were undeveloped but guess what they were really short so like three minutes or something. Like, so you know you you do the action and then you'd say four lights and they go roll out because uh, oh okay but you know they're using them because they were just desperate for saving money but i'm glad that's gone yeah but uh, it's the look that I, and i also say this there are departments that have been eroded away in films now. Uh, I, I've been on sets and I go, where is the crew? Where are they? Where are these people? Like, you know, people that, there just aren't enough people to make the lighting what it should be. What, what, you know, like I've already mentioned, like, where's the continuity? These are time-tested, tried and true kind of departments. And it bothers me sometimes when people rationalize, we don't need them. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Because you're going to eventually go, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I want to 
want to make sure I, I put in because I can't blame you. I want to make sure Bride and Reanimator gets in here because it was four years between the two films, and I don't know if before the before the actual Bride Reanimator that we see was made, if there was discussions to do a version with Stewart. Obviously, the ending of the film would lead you to believe that Barbara's going to be you know resurrected straight away. So, uh, what can you tell me about that period before we actually get the movie? I don't know if we know very much about yeah. it. There was certainly talk right away because of how successful Reanimator was that there would be a sequel, and then it was just kind of, it just kind of like didn't jump out of the box right away. You guys did From Beyond right after, which is a great film we as well. We did. So. I think there may have been some legal stuff that had to be resolved, mm. okay? Um, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Okay. okay. No, I'm going to push that, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so so when it finally did come into fruition, uh, was this a hard sell to get back into that world for you guys, or were you guys eager to kind of jump back into these? Not worlds? for Bruce and I. No, we we went the whole high. Here we go. Woo! <laughs> was it a hard discussion though with Alan Sear? I mean, because obviously, obviously Brian had been the producer, so he's been on the first film. But yeah, that was a little weird. It was a little weird that somebody on the team wasn't there anymore, and, and uh, it was a very pivotal sort of uh, part of the team, and it was like, we don't have that voice and that vision. But yeah, make, make no mistake, there, the first reanimator was kind of magic in a bottle, right? I mean, that's, there was a certain amount of intangible kinds of factors that just worked a lot of happy so accidents. well. Yeah. It was like, wow. This is actually coming together, and you know, one of my fondest memories is watching the dailies of the first one because he went like, oh, "Shit, this is like really working right now." And mm, to going into the second one, you go, the, "The chances of this movie being the first one are really slim." And it doesn't mean it's bad; it's just you know, you have to really tamp down your expectations. I love that. Uh, I asked Brian once about this, and he. Uh, he said, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not very good with actors, but I really like the effects, and I'm really good at pushing the weirdness. Yes. And I was like, oh, that's very awesome. Yeah, he likes the visual gags and the ideas yeah. of, uh, we're going to have that shock, and we're going to have that gag, and then we're going to do that. And it's like, yeah, but well, how do we Society. Yes, yeah, society's just wild. Society. Right? Uh, somebody had a t-shirt in the front row of the last uh, uh, Kathleen, so tell us about being cast in the film, and obviously you have really heavy presents throughout this film. What was that process like for you? Well, the, the casting was, was crazy because it was just, you know, come in and meet 10 different body parts. And they really wanted to see my movement and, um, and, and just a total breakdown, I guess. Just, uh, you know, freak out and cry. So that was, that was fun and uh, easy. Um, the prosthetics were really a challenge. I was so supported by the great guys at KAB that, that were really um, just in charge of the bride. There were so many different visual uh, makeup people on it, but that team, and it was, it started with the KAB guys, Howard, Bob, and Greg, and, and then they had a team of like probably six or seven assistants. And uh, the first day was intense because it was easily a 2 a.m. call time. And by the end of the sixth hour, when they were doing individual pubic hair on me, I was like, I'm done. I absolutely get me out of this chair, this lean to. I'm like, you're just gonna grab some hair and just shove it on there tomorrow. We're not, we're not doing it like their eyelashes, okay? <laughs> That pretty much desensitized me, though. I, I, it was a good moment because, like, after that, I was like, I could, I was really ready for everything. And um, were they fighting over who would attend? <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn. I was very. Good. <laughs> yeah, they all got a turn. And, uh, <laughs> I feel like you're entering a, a pre-established world, though. I mean, obviously, you probably have had the chance to see this movie they entered, see this world, see these characters that I, I saw the movie uh, Reanimator after I got cast in The Bride, and they were like, congratulations, here's a VHS, 
so you can see what you're getting yourself into. And then I got up and watched it and just had a full blown freak out. <laughs> but, um, but I, I, I love the script of Rian, The Bride, so I knew it was going to be out there. I already knew what I was getting into. Um, what I loved was the chemistry between everybody, and I could see that um, I was coming into something that was, that was already really well pre established. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to work with Barbara in, in that film, but we did get to work together. And unfortunately, you got to work with Bruce in that film. Well, that was really We had a great good time, actually. <laughs> Behind the scenes, we were we got a lot of great. We were around. And, and that was great because. Oh, shut up. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. What happened offset? Stays yeah. offset. Oh, no, no. But yeah, I've we been so supported and, and so uh, well taken care of. And, and it, it was obviously very. Um, intense character that, that I had to experience, but I was excited. It was exciting because I felt so much support and enthusiasm and, and you know, how often do you get to rip somebody else's heart out of your own chest? So. <laughs> it was a well, I, I mean, I, I really think the crowd's a testament to what you guys have, have created with these movies. I think they, you're talking about, I think they move very, they have an electric pacing to them. They really can't, I just watched the first one again the other day, and I was just like, Jesus, 88 minutes or something? It flies. It just flies by. It feels like you take, you're taking a film kind of like the Hitchcock book and cutting out the dull bits and making sure the thing and, still has an And I tell you, it's a testament, actually, to editing, which is another really unsung hero. Lee Percy did an incredible job with this movie. Yeah, there were a lot of stuff that was shot, but I mean, that's, I heard a, that a, some writer said a long time, you have to be willing to kill your babies, right? And so at some point you have to think of the overall, and you know, reanimators, you choo-choo train, and it's raging down the tracks, and it's, it's better for that. I, I'm not a fan of uh, some of the iterations where everybody, uh, you know, the German box set, like put everything back in, it's the complete reanimator. No, there's a reason why things were decided not to be a part of it. It's kind of like a musical. Uh, you know, Broadway musical, there's songs that are okay, but you, you know, you, you, you want a, a whole a piece, not a. Not everything yeah. should go into a pie just because you, uh, you did have it. all the ingredients, you know. Uh, so. Yeah, they are. Spielberg always puts that the best. I think he says because he shut all the stuff for jaws on the, for the jaws and, and uh, for the shark. It's like he wants more of it because he shot it and it was hard. Right. <laughs> His editor right. is like, it looks like terrible. It looks like a floating turret. Right. Okay. Kind of down to <laughs> <laughs> Bruce and Barbara all went in and saw the first uh, compiled. Uh, cut of the movie. Do you remember? Yeah. We, we went to Empire Pictures and we sat down in front of a little screen and a three quarter tape kind of thing. And it was like two and a half hours long or something. It was everything that we shot in sequence. And it was like, you don't want to, you can't do that. It, it wasn't reanimated. No, it, it wasn't what we saw in dailies. It was like just the. Yes. One thing pile everything in it and pile on top of each other. It did lacked a lot of artistry. No. They had no no thrust. It, it is interesting that it's as short as it is, though, because back then they would let you go longer. I think That's today, right. yeah. today yeah. they want you to have a shorter movie, and today everybody's watching, you know, binge watching uh, Game of Thrones or whatever you're watching, any or Santa Clarita Diet which just got canceled. I'm so sad. Um, but you know, it's like a half an hour, 45 minutes, killing Eve, whatever. You can, you know, everybody wants that now. But back then, you could, you could have a movie be longer. But, yeah. but, and it was okay. But they knew. They the just person, knew where the knew, music was. But and they where wanted the it to be yeah. brisk, and it worked as a brisk film. Right. Tempo. Yeah. Just uh, keep it going. Yeah. Like, like one of the zombies, Berserker. Go. Like, 
like this panel, I've been rapping, so <laughs> I'll keep it rest. Like, I want to thank you guys for me. Uh, it was a film that made, I haven't talked to Jeff about this before, it was a, a film that made a real impact on me. I think it's, I think the black humor pushes things in such a great direction. Uh, the, the dance between sexuality and horror is such a, it's such a perfectly done film that isn't afraid, never shies away from things, but it isn't, isn't ever tasteless. And I think it's really important. I think there's a reason everyone still loves these movies. Uh, for some reason, because it's the 34th year, it's not the year you think, they have a Awards for you guys to congratulate you. So look at this thing. So let's let's give these guys a round of applause.